There's nearly a 20 year difference between the release of these two rifles and they both seek to accomplish the same thing. Let's see how they do. In 2004, LMT released this monolithic rail platform, especially this, this upper. And in this configuration, it's a 12 inch barrel and uh, 5.56. And when it came out, it really took the world by storm. Yeah, and then we've also started to see nearly 20 years later, SIG starting to manufacture stuff for the NGSW program, trying to get their MCX upper, the Spear LT, uh, into special forces contracts. Well, to boil all of it down, this is effectively the same thing. It's an 11.5 with a piston system, cold hammer forge barrel in 5.56. But with such a time disparity between these two uppers, we're curious which one really stacks up better for a civilian. And we may not necessarily figure out which one is specifically better, but we can bullet point and highlight some of the differences between these two. Instead of just throwing numbers around for hours, let's actually go shoot these things. Yeah, cool. We have both these firearms configured about the same as possible. We were able to get the muzzle device off this MCX, which on these Gen 3s can be a little bit rare. We both have magnifiers, lasers, and lights. We're gonna start by shooting these unsuppressed, and we're gonna try to assess felt recoil. So we're just gonna shoot doubles at 10 yards and see how much these sights are actually jumping around on us. So, Drew, when you get all gassed up, let's rip it. Oh, I thought there was a time box. All right, so I'm seeing the pattern. Now obviously we have two different shooters, but we can at least talk about how well, these let's go. Let's be real, the two different shooters definitely matters because uh, Josh has no rust and I have some all rust. <laughs> <laughs> this is hilarious. Ah, it's okay. You've been busy editing. I'm, I've been over here shooting a bunch. So uh, one of the things in regards to felt recoil or how much those sights are actually moving around on you has to do with how much gas is coming back into the system. And because both of these uppers are piston, there's another feature that we can get out of piston uppers, one of which is adjustable gas blocks. And that you can do that as well with DI or direct impingement guns, but it starts to become a little bit more complex. The gun starts to get gummed up, especially if you are adding suppressors onto the end of the firearm, which thank God we're gonna be able to do here. You can actually adjust how much gas and how much pressure is hitting your gas block and pushing that piston back to cycle. So, that's one of the reasons we were curious to actually compare these two a little bit. You can run this drill and just see when I hammer that trigger as fast as I can twice, how much are my sights actually moving on the target? And that's gonna give you a little bit of a result there. So that's one thing to pay attention to. Piston uppers do go up in price a little bit. Drew's LMT upper is gonna cost closer to the, the $2,000, $2,200 price point-ish for just the upper. And that's, a, that's an expensive upper. This Sig Spear LT upper is gonna be $1,700 for just the upper and the adapter to put it onto an AR lower. But you have to keep in mind that you also have to buy an MCX stock and that's gonna get you closer to that $2,000 price point as well. So they're about the same price point, but uh, they're, they're doing things a little bit differently. And we'll continue to get into that too. Drew, anything to add? I'm just gonna be embarrassed this whole dang video. You son of a gun. I knew I should have came out here and shot a lot last week. So one thing to note, both LMT and SIG sent us these uppers. So, uh, you know, we don't really have a dog in the fight. We're just, we just test these things, we shoot them, we evaluate them, and uh, we use them to make cool videos, so yeah. There's three buttons on the top, right? The one that's the most prominent is the NV button for night vision. When you push that button, either accidentally or on purpose, because it's the most prominent, it goes into <clears throat> night vision mode. Well, when you unpush that button, after you start toggling around between your like, up, 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 wait, did it turn itself off? No, it didn't, down, 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 what's going on here? Oh, it's in night vision mode. 
and then you push the button, finally you can see your dot again. The brightness that it brings you back to is full brightness. Like the power of the sun, holy cow. Bloomed out, super crazy. And then you have to toggle between your brightness settings again, as opposed to something else, a lot of other optics out there. If you do accidentally or intentionally push the night vision button, and then you push it again, it takes you back to the setting that you were previously at that was set for the brightness that you were in. I'm gonna go back to zeroing. All right, we'll go low ready, two to the chest, one to the head. You good? Yep. Stand by. One, five, two. Sick. One, seven, two. Not bad for high ready. Okay. One, five, four. One, four, nine. Good job. Wow, faster from high ready. Yep. Uh, what does the weight of your gun feel like as far as going from low ready or high ready? At well, least you've shot enough other guns like BCMs and stuff like that. How does it feel? This is the heaviest gun I own. Oh, really? In terms of like ARs. Yep. It's super, super chonky, but I use that as a way to punish myself for being small. Does it shoot any softer because it's heavy? Yes. Okay. Yeah, yeah it definitely, um, yeah, it's just, it's smooth shooting. Yeah. Part of that is just the weight of the monolithic upper. The other part is the fact that I have like the lights and stuff out here on it. So Right, yeah. which is a, an, a cool point. If you guys didn't know, the upper itself, monolithic being one item, from the back of the upper all the way to the front up here is one piece of 7075 T6 aluminum. It's a super durable uh, handguard and complete upper. And that means that if you are mounting stuff like iron sights, your optic, or even a laser out on the front, it's all a part of the upper, which is tied to the barrel. It's gonna hold zero. Whereas on something like this, you can swap handguard super easy. You undo two bolts, pop your, uh, your pivot pin, and your handguard slides off. But that also means that the front of my handguard is a free floating device on its own. And so things like mounting a laser, you have to be cognizant of. It just changes a little bit about how the gun actually works, but Drew's getting bored again. Let's keep shooting. All right, guys, it doesn't take much for uh, firearms to need to be involved in a real life situation, but something that's even more realistic is the fact that food can run out. It's all of a sudden not being delivered to your grocery stores, or maybe you or your family just have ice on the roads or flooding, whatever the case is, you're gonna wanna be prepared with food. And for that, you're gonna wanna go to My Patriot Supply. Go ahead and check out preparewithdc.com and that'll save you $60 with each month of food that you choose to buy and store. That food also lasts 25 plus years on the shelf, which is an incredible amount of time. Buy it, store it, save it for those real life uh, emergencies. All right, so two on steel from three different positions. One, two, three, stand by. Man, some mics in there. Yeah. Gosh. Nin 19 seconds. 19? It's 11.45. Oh man, 21 seconds. 12.23. <laughs> One thing to note is these guns don't even, they don't even cycle the same. And we'll pull these bolts apart and actually show you. It can be hard to do on YouTube, but we'll show you what we got. The AR, as in the LMT, when you actually get it, while it is a piston system, you're gonna get a different bolt and your gas rings sit up at the, the gas block itself as opposed to back on the bolt. And your piston and your springs are actually causing that gun to cycle a little bit differently, but it still sits on an AR platform the same on your lower, your buffer system and your spring, you're still gonna be swapping those out just the same way. So if you have extra parts and pieces, like your buffer system, you can tune it the way that you typically do. Whereas on this MCX, it's designed a lot more like a AR-180 or a BRN-180, whatever that model is. Also kind of like an AK, uh, kind of like a lot of other guns that have already been designed this way where you have the springs sitting up on top of the bolt. 
and it has a little bit of a different felt recoil. Um, it's shorter and snappier, kind of like a Glock 19, as opposed to shooting something like a Glock 34 just applied to a rifle. Now, if you do get something like this, making those modifications, changing your, your spring or your muzzle device, man, if you, don't, if you don't have the head knowledge of making some of those parts and pieces fit together, it can be a pain and you're gonna have to relearn a different system. Well, as previously stated, getting a muzzle device swapped out on this MCX upper, oh my gosh, there's Reddit forums out the wazoo of people talking about and complaining, I ruined my upper, I ruined this barrel, just trying to get the muzzle device swapped out. So if you already own a 5.56 suppressor and you're thinking, I'll just throw that on my MCX, not necessarily gonna be the case. Uh, we got, I wanna say a little bit lucky, but I worked long, hard hours to get this thing off and was finally able to make it happen. Um, Drew, any other thoughts on AR uh, cycling systems and how those bolts actually function? Nope. Guys, if you really like this build, our buddies over at Gun Mag Warehouse, uh, they're big supporters of our channel. Uh, they have a lot of really cool things that we can't always talk about on camera or show being attached, but uh, you know things like optics and uh, other accessories that are just really cool. You should go and check them out, Gun Mag Warehouse. Uh, there's a link in the description. Uh, and our boy Jeremy over there is just a solid cat. So go say hi, pick, some, pick up some cool stuff. All right, let me miss this again. All right, so I've shot this gun a lot, thousands of rounds, um, but I haven't shot that yet, so let's swap. Okay. And do like a... Oh, oh, give me my oh. gun back. Uh, let's do like a, I guess a bill drill. Okay. It feels good, it's definitely punchier. Obviously not wearing it with a plate carrier would make it, you know, a little more. a little bit more, but yeah. yeah, that's not bad. Stand by, don't suck. Okay, that sucked. Thanks. Let me run that again. Let me run that again. <laughs> I rubbed. Got a nice little ejection pattern. Yeah. It feels good. There's something that LMT did about the, their bolts where they actually uh, allow chamber pressures to swell a little bit longer um, so that the, the ejector and the extractor don't have to work as hard. And here we go again. I, it's funny, but you can actually feel that. First of all, the piston system, as well as the fact that you probably have this, this buffer system tuned for the gun, and that's not something that you can necessarily do nearly as well with an MCX, is have the freedom to start tuning things and making sure that, hey, I added a suppressor. While I have my gas block and I can swap that back and forth, it doesn't necessarily feel nearly as adjustable as taking parts and pieces and swapping parts out in your buffer system, right? Yep. Cool. All right, I got another drill I wanna run. Okay. Course of fire is drop to prone, two rounds from here, run to the, the bench, five rounds in total. You know it's high to low and then low to high. We're starting at, just so the audience knows, 170 yards. Son of a gun. There we go. go. There's two. Oh yeah, there you go. Yeah, get down there. Jeez. You're doing a great job, Josh. Thanks, thanks, thanks. Oh, no. Oh, no. Who's here with this gun? There you go, finish strong. There you go. 54-36. Oh, sheesh. I thought you were pointing to a snake. That's like how I lost my wedding ring. Oh, nice. 
Nope. Nuh-uh. Close. Yeah, that's it. Oh now. That's it. Hit. Gosh, you got this, dude. Hit. Hit. Lord. My knee is barking. The dogs are barking too. How's your zero? A little off? Eh. A little off. I think it's more me than zero. Okay, fair what enough. What was it? 75, 31. Oh, gosh dang it. Yeah. Hit! It. It's supposed to be two hits, my bad. Top. Hit! Uh. Hit! Oh, got his socks wet. Hit! Hit! 5460. Get out of here. <laughs> Get out of here. Dude. Specialist Jones. <laughs> well, dock me because I only did one hit up there. What is better than owning multiple 556 five, rifles? Owning one really good one and night vision. You see, night vision is a really cool thing to invest in because it expands the capability of the individual and of the family or the group that they're a part of. So whenever it comes to night vision, there's there's quite a few decent companies out there, but the one that we've had the longest relationship with is Steel Industries. We've been buddies for a very long time and they've made a reputation in the industry as being a good source to purchase night vision from because of availability. They have a ton of different units at a ton of different price ranges to meet most budgets. Uh, they also have incredible customer support and those dudes actually use their stuff. They will take out their whole customer service team and shoot with all different types of night vision, all different aiming devices, IR lasers, IR illuminators. They know their stuff and that's why we trust them. We're buddies. They're also now supporters of the channel, which is awesome. So if you're looking to invest in a, an expensive capability uh, for the rest of your life, um, check out Steel Industries. So Drew shot this rifle a fair amount. We're starting to get close to probably 1,500 rounds on this upper, which is hardly anything at all. It's honestly getting close to a break-in period for the upper and the barrel itself. But that brings us to an interesting point, is having extra parts on hand. And we did a whole video on being aware of what extra kind of parts and pieces you should have for your rifle, your pistol, so on and so forth. Well, um, Shoot, sorry. Keeping keeping parts and pieces on hand for your rifle, what like up, ensuring that your uh, your gas rings. No, that's not important. Are gonna. Sorry, I've got I've got to take this. Your so gas rings on your on Micah your put, rifle and what, your pistol. <clears throat> Did it melt? Uh, gas rings, gas rings. Okay, so the fact that these are piston systems, yeah. they do have gas rings in different locations. You may have seen in a little bit of B-roll that we did previously. There's no gas rings in the bolt, even on this AR style. LMT, and those, those gas rings are up here inside of the piston. Well, LMT states that they've never had a customer reach back out and say that their gas rings have actually worn out to the point of failure. And when you take this piston apart, you'll actually see that, yeah, those gas rings are super durable. They're thick, even probably two or three times as thick as standard gas rings on an AR. And then inside of an MCX, they actually have a one-piece spring-style gas ring. And that's pretty stellar. You can pick one of those up for $13. Not a bad idea to have on hand as just a backup, an extra piece. The barrels, an extra part that can wear down over time. Both of these barrels are Cold Hammer Forge 1 and 7 Twist, and they're stellar. They're designed for heavier rounds, which is obviously intended for a little bit more combat. So we're once again reaching back to the point that these are built for duty use. 1 and 7 Twist, it's going to stabilize a heavier round a little bit better. 
Uh, gas rings and the interior designs of these pistons, they're just a lot, you done? They're just a lot more stable and sturdy. Not to say that something like a Mark 18 or a DI system isn't bad, but these piston systems, they're very stout and they're built for long time, heavy duty use. What, do you have anything that you would like to add to the class? No, we should probably redo that whole take. Sorry, Charlie called. No, I'm, that's, that's all, I said it, Dude, I got it done. Micah took a three rounds rifle, three rounds pistol. Awesome. 459. 459. Nice. Do you use any of those ambi parts that come on the no. that lower? None on this one. It's uh so if I actually dry fired with it enough and train with that, yes. I'm just so used to the bad lever or just hitting that button. Yeah, same. The only ambidextrous thing I use on a rifle is just technically a charging handle. Yeah, the placement of it's a little awkward for me in yeah. my small trump hands. I get that. <laughs> it's cool though. Yep. The thing I like about that is that they actually use some mil-spec parts for their ambi components as opposed to like wild wazoo different things that you can't even get. Gotcha. Well, uh, let's do some closing thoughts to make sure that uh, we're on the same page with these. Okay. Cool. All right, real fast. Similarities and differences between these two, because they're both high quality uppers trying to do the same thing. Uh, they're both compact, designed for more of a CQB or shorter gun. Um, 5.56, cold hammer forged, piston. They both have switch block style gas blocks where you can go more or less gas. Uh, they have some ambidextrous controls. That being said, this is just an MCX upper, whereas Drew has an LMT lower. They both run on AR lowers. And I'm sure there's other similarities that you guys can see here, uh, but differences. Well, obviously the MCX is not an AR. It uses some of those same ergonomics, but the recoiling system is not an AR. And there's pros and cons to that. The AR is not the end all be all. This is a phenomenal system. Uh, it just doesn't play the same way as if you have some extra parts and pieces for an AR kicking around. They both shoot very well with the way that we have them set up. A dot and a magnifier, these Flow 556 suppressors. We both have Mod Lite OKWs on here, lasers, hand stops to some degree, um, and they're both very functional rifles. Now, I can tell you which one I have a preference on if I had to pick one of these. Drew, what features do you like about this or this setup? and which would you pick if you had to just like grab one and that was your gun for the next 10 years? Well, definitely the LMT, but I mean, I want an MCX also. <laughs> like this is a very convenient gun because of, well, to me, it's the weight difference. Like this is just somewhat easier to use just because it's just, it's smaller, it's sleeker. Um, granted, I, I, I opted for the, you know, full pick rail version of this. LMT makes other versions that are, you know, sleeker and M-lock and all that stuff. But if I had one gun to, keep with me kind of like for the rest of my life that I knew could just absolutely go through the ringer, it would be the LMT upper. Um, it's also kind of like an heirloom item. You know what I mean? Like yes. whenever you hear stories about, you know, people, or your friends, when their fathers or their grandfathers pass away, they hand them down rifles or shotguns. And um, the, the thing that I don't want my kids to say whenever I pass on is, oh yeah, he left me these 50 guns and they're all garbage and they just have to sell them all. Right. Um, if there was one in that pass me down inheritance, it would be this. Sure. Well, and I'm kind of of the same mindset. There's a caveat there though. If I'm just getting into firearms for the first time, or I have the finances to explore something different, I really have little interest in AKs. I have some interest in bolt guns, but I'm not really there yet. And so if I wanted to get something that shot different, felt different, had a different recoil system, and I wanted to learn something new, I would spring for an MCX, no question. That being said, getting into the world of firearms, or even if you already have one AR and you're wanting to upgrade and have that really solid setup, there's a lot of upsides to having a firearm that functions the same for the most part and uses a lot of the same parts and pieces like recoil springs. Um, granted, this uses an AR trigger, 
This does as well, but that's relatively new. The Virtus didn't use standard mil-spec AR triggers, that you had to have one of their own triggers. So to boil it down, if I only had one, it'd be hard, I'd be hard pressed to pick between the two, but because I have so much money and time invested in having parts and pieces and understanding this weapon system, I'd still pick an AR-15. But if I'm looking to explore and try something new, an MCX would be uh, hard to argue away from. Yeah, and it's kind of like this, you know, we're talking about buy once, cry once guns. Yeah. These are not, you know, these are not BCMs. They're not- Plinkers. They're not, not, not that a BCM is a cheap gun. It's a great gun, but you know, we're not talking about just cheap training guns. These right. are premium. It's something you save up for. It's something you put a lot of time and effort into making sure you get right. As far as buy once, cry once guns go, I would be happy with either one of these. Yeah, and so. if I and if I was going to get an MCX, I would be getting a Spear LT, not one of the Vertices. Personal opinion, uh, but they've made enough upgrades and taken close to a whole pound off of the upper, using titanium components for some parts as well. It's a big deal because those other Vertices, you've shot those Vertices a fair amount. A lot. And they're heavy. Yep. They're very heavy. And this this LT is very nice. The big thing to note here, though, is regardless of which route you go when you're purchasing really nice rifles that can last a lifetime is uh, they're only as good as you are. Josh outshot me on everything today. Nick outshot both of us a couple yeah. times. So it's only as good as you are in the training and the, and the dry fire and the time that you put into it. Um, so figure out where you're at and just make a note to get better Agreed. next time. On that note, guys, if you do want to support us, we have Patreon. That helps keep us going. We try to pay attention to that and get back to DMs and comments there as fast as possible. We also, if our editing time permits uh, and posting time, we upload videos and pictures and things like that sooner than posting to any other social media. Early uh, access. Early access kind of stuff. We also have uh, products on our store, so merch, like these hats that you're seeing, hoodies, beanies, things like that. You can go ahead and check that out as well. Um, lots being updated there uh, behind the scenes too, which I'm pretty excited about. Yep. So with that guys, make sure you're getting really good training, being financially wise. Thank you again for watching and uh, take care. Profile picture on my iPhone. Are you serious? It makes me so happy. Oh, I can't get my bolt back in. I really have to just stop filming. Here we go.